Welcome to Breakfast with the Chiefs. Uh, I am Matthew Hart and uh, the CEO for Longwoods Publishing and this is our last Breakfast with the Chiefs before the holidays, if you get holidays. Uh, one quick housekeeping note, um, we will have time for a little bit of Q&A at the end. I will have a handheld mic, so if you have a question, uh, I'll bring the mic to you. Uh, I wanted to quickly thank uh, the Canadian Foundation for Healthcare Improvement and uh, Sinai Health Systems. Uh, without these two organizations, we would not be able to put on this morning's event. And last point is, uh, I have met a fair number of you, but I've not met all of you. So if you do have an opportunity, I'd love to meet people. I uh, love to, you know, expand my network. So feel free to come up and talk to me at any point. And uh, without any further delay, Dr. Hartley Stern. Bonjour tout le monde. Uh, good morning, everyone. Um, it, I want to thank uh, Longwoods for inviting me and giving me this opportunity to speak to you today. It's, uh, this is a little bit of ho old home week here. I um, did part of my residency in surgery in this building and practiced here for about 12 years. Had one son and two grandsons um, born here, so this is uh, truly a gestational event for me. Um, and I'm, I'm grateful. I'm I have a single goal today. Um, uh, I think many of you have this perception of uh, the CMPA as that organization that looks after doctors when they get into trouble. Uh, that's not who we are. I mean, we do look after doctors when they have um, get themselves into some trouble, but my objective here this morning um, is really quite simple, to sp spur our collective imaginations um, on how the CMPA might help you um, in each one of your organizations in achieving its objectives in safe medical care. Um, how can we work more effectively uh, to do what we need to do to transform the much needed healthcare transformations that um, are required today? My primary message that I hope I can drive home and that I hope that gets uh, through to you clearly is that um, is one of collaboration uh, and that the valuable efforts that you're all making in trying to improve whatever, whatever it is you're trying to improve in your institutions um, will require help and that the CMPA is here as an organization committed to trying to help institutions become better at what they're trying to do. I do believe that um, the, the sum is greater than the, the parts in terms of trying to get things done. Um, and that by working together, uh, we can do this. And I'm going to walk you through some of the examples of what we at the CMPA are currently doing um, with others uh, to try and improve the healthcare system, to transform those elements that need transforming. Um, and I'm, I'm going to leave enough time at the end for questions that I think um, if there's future uh, work that we can do together, I would look forward to it. Um, I'm hoping that this is just a talk but it also is the beginning of a discussion between your organization and the CMPA as to truly um, what is possible for us to work on together. Okay, now I didn't check this ahead of time. And, oh, wrong, wrong button. You know, this, this, is, this is a teaser. This is meant for those people over the age of 60 to say, see, push this button and you'll look like the idiot your kids think you are when this is the button you should be pushing um, here, or here, or here, or here, or. Okay. Can you see that those are people there? Because uh, when I was working on this slide, some people said, what the hell is that? Uh, it's actually a whole bunch of people trying to look like um, fitting together as gears. Uh, uh, symbolically, the metaphor to me is quite powerful. Um, it, it does take collaboration. Uh, the word collaborative is probably overused more times than I can think of when people want to talk about things but don't actually want to do things. So I like the, the notion of people coming together and forming into a, a enmeshed gears because they're actually doing something. Um, I th and it needs people from all disciplines. And because we're known as an organization that looks after physicians, we're often overlooked uh, as an organization that might help you as a provider 
um, and having multiple different levels of people working with you. Our vision for safe medical care involves multiple factors. Um, Today I'm going to fo focus on four interrelated areas that I suspect are pro priorities in each one of your organizations. The first is reducing harm. The, septing, the second is ad uh, safely adopting technology. The third is increasing provider wellness. And the fourth is improving and enhancing culture. And let me tell you first why the CMPA is well positioned to help you and your organization in driving improvements through the system, specifically on those four areas. So our strategic plan at the CMPA focuses on our commitment to support both physicians and advance improvements in safe, in safe medical care. We are the largest medical organization in the country, uh, giving us insight into one of the largest groups of healthcare professionals, uh, physicians. As a national organization, we have both a local and a national perspective on issues and opportunities across multiple healthcare systems from coast to coast to coast. And we have 118 years of experience, and we have the largest collection of physician medical legal data in the country. We have a team of dedicated uh, researchers and statisticians, some of whom are here today, whose job it is to analyze the data and highlight factors that impact the safety of medical care. Our support and services are well received. We enjoy member satisfaction rates in the high 90s. Physicians trust us and trust that we will act in their best interests um, to promote better patient care. This strategic uh, direction, the wealth of our data, uh, and the trusting relationship, and I emphasize the word trusting, combined with our continuous efforts to improve and understand um, our service to our members, places us in a very strong position, a position where we have excellent insight to the local and national issues facing physicians, their teams, their institutions, um, and the healthcare system writ large. With this insight, we are able to engage physicians and other healthcare professionals in meaningful conversations around improvements in care. We are able to develop targeted programs and services, some of, some of which uh, many of you are already engaged in, and others that I'd like to interest you in. Um, all these programs foster safe medical care, and at the, at the individual, at the team, and at the institutional level as well. And we're able to build these collaborative relationships and enhance medical care across all of the systems in the country. Now, leveraging this position, we are working uh, with others to, to uh, contribute to the improvement in those four areas that I outlined earlier. And now I'm going to give you some examples of um, what I'm talking about. Well, just forgive me for a minute. It is a feature of speaking that you get a dry mouth. Now, as an organization, we do leverage our insights and our expertise to create evidence-based solutions and strategies to reduce patient harm. In 2017, you see the word SAGES there, we created a subsidiary, SAGES, to expand our ability to support all healthcare providers. Prior to that, we essentially looked after physicians, and now we're able to look after all types of health healthcare providers, not just physicians. SAGES' safe, SAGES is safe care programs and practice management solutions extend beyond CMPA's member focus, that is physician focused support, and are available to healthcare teams, clinics, uh, institutions, and individual healthcare providers. And through SAGES, we are developing programming to support more effective team interactions, fostering safer care, and reducing harm. For example, we are delivering tailored workshops and train the trainer modules to leaders and providers probably uh, in some of your own institutions, and certainly across one of the, an entire Western province, uh, focusing on, on how to communicate unexpected uh, outcomes in practice. CMPA is also partnering to improve safety and reduce harm in high-risk specialties. Our data show that certain areas of practice uh, have higher risk. In obstetrics, for example, um, risks involving mothers and babies uh, are uh, infrequent but unfortunately, uh, often catastrophic events. 
In 2018, we entered into a formal partnership with High Rock uh, Hospital Insur Insurance Reciprocal of Canada and the Society of Obstetricians and Gynecologists of Canada as equal partners in Salus Global. Now, Salus Global is a leader in obstetrical safety programs and provider of the renowned uh, More OB program. Uh, I think, is Catherine Galton in the audience? I think she was supposed to be. Um, she and Jenny Blake of the SOGC and Catherine of High Rock, I wanted to give them a shout out and thanks for their efforts in making this happen. Um, during the last 15 years, More OB has essentially enhanced the delivery of safety and the safety of obstetrics across this country and across North America, but most particularly in Canada. This partnership that we entered in, into with these two significant uh, organizations is rooted in our shared um, desire, our shared set of values, uh, and our shared commitment to advance the safety of obstetrical care in this country. Um, and we believe, as I suggested, um, like the healthcare system writ large, we are better um, as a whole uh, than the sum of the parts. With the combined expertise of these three organizations, Salus Global will continue to grow, uh, giving healthcare teams across the country access to harm reduction strategies and enhancing the safety of care in both obstetrics and expand into other high-risk specialties and, and reducing the chances of catastrophic events for mothers and babies in Canada. Salus Global is a great example of what is possible uh, and we believe there's strong evidence that more OB should exist in every single birthing unit in this country. But there's much more than we can, we can do. As I suggested, the CMPA has extensive data holdings, and our, but our data is largely confined to what has gone wrong. And I'd ask you for a moment to think about what we could do if we took all of your data sources and combined them, and the power of that to figure out what can we do right. As many of you know, the CMPA is a strong advocate of the effective use of safety checklists, and we actively support um, Choosing Wisely uh, Canada in reducing unnecessary tests and procedures. And through access to our 100,000 members, we can help widely disseminate, for any of you who want our help, we can widely disseminate the safety lessons proven effective to the local area. We can help you get your message out to the country. There's no question in my mind, um, absolutely none, that we are facing um, extraordinary challenges in implementing the te technologic solutions that are gonna help us become a safer healthcare system. I think a number of my predecessors who gave talks at this uh, breakfast with uh, the chiefs have talked about the uh, technologic solutions. And at the CMPA, we actually do generally support the implementation of a technology. Um, promising procedures, um, anything that is going to improve the safety of, of health care. I want to emphasize this. We are not, I want to say it again, we are not an obstacle to the implementation of technology. On the contrary, we actively assist in supporting the safe adoption and effective technologies, particularly when there is general, there, there can be resistance to this kind of change amongst physicians and other providers. However, we do know that there are risks, both medical legal risks and, um, and patient care risks uh, with the implementation of technologies. And with our subsidiary SAGES, we are absolutely committed to optimizing the, the safe implementation of technology while reducing risks. And I'll give you an example. We have now formally, SAGES, uh, through SAGES, we have formally entered into a partnership with the company called Surgical Safety Technologies, uh, centered here in Toronto. Uh, the creator of the operating room black box, and we are working to bring this, our safe OR program uh, combined with the black box uh, platform uh, into every operating room in the country. Building on the data analysis of the black box, and the safe OR program helps all members of the surgical team, all members of the surgical team, and that's the nurses, the anesthetists, uh, the surgeons, everyone in the room, improve safety, culture, and efficiency uh, in the operating room. Now, the OR Black Box, for those of you who don't read Time Magazine, I think last week was chosen as one of the most important and influential healthcare technologies of 2019. Um, it is uh, being disseminated in Europe and in the US, and we believe that um, we are going to see huge improvements as a result of its deployment in the rest of Canada. We've also helped governments, physicians, and others 
with reducing risk associated with electronic records. Anybody here not have any issues with electronic health records in your institutions? Um, including those related to uh, privacy. We've done extensive work in the province of Alberta trying uh, particularly on the issue of privacy. We don't provide technical solutions, but we do share advice and guidance, and because we are in every province in the country, we can share what we've learned in provinces such as Alberta with those in other organizations in other jurisdictions. Again, we believe there's a lot that we can do to improve the adoption of new technologies, including how providers respond to these new capabilities. We are very encouraged by the adoption of virtual care and artificial intelligence. Um, that said, we know that when technology outpaces policies and regulation, and we saw this with the EHR, um, adoption becomes extremely challenging. And there are very serious medical legal risks um, when those frameworks are not uh, in place. There is absolutely an urgency, a real urgency, to developing the policies and regulations um, and regulatory frameworks prior to adopting new technologies in practice. Virtual care and AI are simply two examples, um, and the two most pressing examples of that requirement, but they're not the only ones. We believe the CMPA has both a vital role and, and the expertise needed to help providers safely adopt new technologies. We make sub submissions every year on policies to every single government and every single regulator in the country on areas that it will help improve the safety and um, fairness of the healthcare system. We are eager to work with you, with governments, hospitals, industry, and others proactively to identify and resolve technology issues and turn the promise of new healthcare technology into a reality. I don't think I have to say this to anyone in this room that one of the biggest challenges we're facing in Canada is um, the wellness of healthcare providers. Uh, increasingly, healthcare providers are tired, uh, they're uh, depressed, and burnt out. Um, not only is uh, burnout contagious, but the data shows that um, burnout leads to um, unsafe uh, healthcare delivery. There's rarely a single factor in uh, leading to provider burnout. We need a system level approach to dealing with it. Uh, multiple levels of the healthcare system have to get engaged um, to support the providers, uh, all of them, uh, in the healthcare system. We're at the CMPA working to do that, just that. We are engaging physician healthcare programs across the country to better understand this and support the services available and appropriately share this information with our members in need. Our own physician staff, we've had uh, workshops, uh, extraordinary workshops, to assist our own physicians and the lawyers that we hire uh, to help physicians better understand um, the stress that physicians uh, uh, undergo. I recall at one of the workshops, one of the lawyers that we hired telling me that as a consequence of, his, um, of the training we've given him, uh, he recognized in one of his uh, physicians that this physician may have um, serious uh, risks of, of self-harm, and he made a house call. The lawyer actually went over to the physician's home, worked with the wife, and immediately got the physician uh, urgent uh, care through an emergency department that he required, uh, which he otherwise might not have obtained. At the institutional level, we are educating physician leaders and through SAGES offer more specialized training in just culture, which I'll speak more about in a moment. At the regulatory and policy levels, we are working with partners and stakeholders to advocate for and communicate the importance of provider wellness and fair processes. If we are collectively going to make a dent uh, in ending hallway medicine, I gather that's an objective in Ontario, we need to do more to support the wellness of our frontline providers. I'm a former hospital CEO in Quebec. I recognize the, the, the importance of local support and assistance in helping out our colleagues. But I believe that in most jurisdictions, the problem has outpaced and outstripped the resources and capacity to deal with it. We are looking forward to working with others to take a more comprehensive approach to provider wellness. This is not a physician issue. This is not a nurse issue. Um, this is a holistic issue that impacts all providers and all institutions. Let's start by sharing data 
and strategies, and then actively looking at ways to make all of our institutions and all the people who work in them healthier. I'd like to spend a moment now talking about what we're doing to improve culture. Um, and I want to use the word trust. I do believe that the missing element in our healthcare system um, in terms of moving, events, moving our strategies forward is trust. Um, trust between patient and provider, uh, trust uh, between the provider and the system that it, it, within it's working, and trust between providers. Healthcare runs on trust or stagnates because of a lack of trust. And that is why we've launched the Just Culture Program for institutions, leaders, and providers. Our tailored programs focus on enhancing trust across teams and institutions and supports the adoption of a culture of learning to improve safety, um, patient safety. Hospitals and, and institutions are very excited to hear about our Just Culture program and uptake is uh, actually quite rapid now. There is growing evidence that this program is working in other jurisdictions, the United States and in Europe, and we need to adopt it widely in this country. Our data is very clear that one of the primary causes of patient harm is a breakdown in communication, uh, be it between providers, uh, between patient and provider. Um, it is the communication that is, is central to almost all harm. We have developed specific training programs to help individuals, teams, and institutions improve communication. We also know that unprofessional behavior, if tolerated, can undermine a culture of safety. And we have programs and tools to help leaders, your leaders, address these often difficult situations. And we welcome opportunities to work with you and your teams and drawing on our experience, support just culture in your institutions. Now my last slide, um, again, I wanna reinforce the notion of collaboration. In the same way that physicians can no longer practice effectively in isolation, the CMPA can no longer work in isolation. Health transformation is not easy. If it were easy, you would have all done it by now. And none of us can do it alone. To drive impactful change, we all need to be rowing in the same direction. Nice metaphor, right? Um, we need a team approach. I've shared some of the examples of what we're doing at the CMPA to address the issues that you face every day and the areas that I personally would like to work with you on. The CMPA will always be the association that um, provides valued and reliable medical liability protection to its members. That's not going away. But the message I do really want to leave with you, we're also the organization that is actively and significantly promoting advances in the safe medical care delivery across this country, especially through impactful collaborations. Everybody in this room shares the goal of delivering safe um, and efficient care. Nobody gets up in the morning and says, today I think I'm going to deliver mediocre care in my institution. Today is the day I'm going to deliver, I'm going to hurt somebody. Nobody wakes up that, that way, but every day something bad happens in this country. We need to work together to address the challenges facing our health care system and improve the safety of care for all Canadians. I'd like to thank you for joining me today, and je vous remercie de votre présence aujourd'hui. Merci, and I have, I think, some time for questions. I kept this mercifully short to try and engage those collaborations. So we do have some time for questions, if anybody has any. Hi, uh, thank you very much. It's, it's been fascinating because, uh, and uh, now I'm a little bit out of touch having been completely retired for uh, almost a couple of years now. But I wanted to ask you, it, it's interesting to hear about the ramifications which go so far beyond the, uh, as you st said right at the beginning, the traditional view of CMPA that's just there to pull physicians out the mess they get themselves in with legal problems. Um, one of particular interest to me, 
used to be called, and I don't know, you, you'll know the answer to this question. When I first came to Canada, it was called the Impaired Physician Program. Can you believe it? You remember that? <laughs> Talk about uh, a wrong choice of words. Then fortunately, it grew into what's called the Physician Support Programs. And I think every province uh, certainly did have, I'm not, not sure if they still do, and it's a joint effort between the medical associations and the College of Physicians and Surgeons in each province. And um, it was fascinating to me, especially as, uh, I mean, as you know, I was a surgeon, but in the last years of my career, I moved into senior administration and as VP medical of the biggest, uh, what used to be the biggest hospital in the medical commonwealth, in the British commonwealth, namely uh, Vancouver General, there were a lot of problems uh, dealing with physicians and the kind of problems they were getting into were interestingly moving steadily away from impaired with drugs and alcohol, although that still was, was an issue for some, but increasingly moving into behavior issues that really had to, to, to be dealt with and that were clearly manifestations of very, very unhappy physicians. Uh, fortunately, relatively few amongst a large number of physicians, but could you tell me if the CMPA is tied up with that organization and if it's still working in that way? most but not all provinces. Uh, PEI, for example, uh, buys service from British Columbia, believe it or not. At how that works, I'm not so sure. I think um, these programs are very effective and we link, that's what I was alluding to, uh, when we sense a physician's in trouble on the phone, we get them into support with one of the PHPs. The problem being that um, the requirement far outstrips the capacity for many of the PHPs to actually serve physicians. That's problem one. Problem two is it's not a physician in isolation problem. All the evidence points to um, there are institutional, it's, I mean, there may be issues at home, there may be issues in the workplace, and there may be issues intrinsic to that physician. But unless you deal with all three, that is what's going on in, in the rest of that physician's life, it's of, no, it's, it's of limited value. So you can take a physician, heal that physician from whatever is troubling him, but if he's working, he or she is working in a toxic environment, in a, in a, in a hospital that is um, really not functional, um, then you haven't helped that physician and you haven't helped the institution. So taking a more holistic view of the physician's health, the organizational health, the other providers in that organization who are all suffering, um, likely with the same issues, um, is the approach that we're trying to take by collaborating with uh, PHPs and others. It's the reason we're trying to train trainers. It's the reason we're trying to put the Just Culture program in, into every hospital in the, in the country. So when you see a physician who's starting to get out of control and is starting to behave, someone who's been behaving normally, suddenly she's starting to behave badly, what's going on early and get them into uh, preventative programs which the Just Culture program that we're deploying, um, you know, is, is actually tailored to do. Up here at the top. Thank you very much uh, for your presentation. I'm Patricia Sullivan Taylor. I'm a registered nurse, but also now work with Health Standards Organization and Accreditation Canada. So very supportive of the message that you uh, were sharing this morning. I think um, one of the standards that we're working on, which is a new standard, is around clinical governance. So you spoke about um, culture. Um, what I didn't hear you speak about is sort of the role of clinical leaders in in the governance of health uh, facilities, so health systems as well as healthcare organizations. So maybe can you speak a little bit to the how you're helping to build the capacity of physicians as clinical leaders and that role that you think that they play in clinical governance? Yeah, it's, it's, a, it's a very good question. Um, so the area that we're focusing on is not training that physician to be, you know, in finance, um, administrative details, in negotiation, the other skills that physicians who are becoming leaders uh, required to be effective leaders in the governance structure. 
um, we're, we're training them in how to deal with complex interpersonal problems, how to deal with one of their colleagues who is behaving badly, how to deal with a colleague who may be showing, exhibiting early signs uh, of a healthcare problem, um, you know, an impairment problem, and, and how to deal with that fairly and how to deal with that effectively. Um, so our focus is really on training leaders to deal with the cultural, the safety, um, and the human elements uh, of the job. We're leaving the administrative and the financial and all the other components to where it belongs within the hospital or within the governance structure of the regional health authority or whatever it is. I'm hoping I've answered your question. Oh, thank you very much. Uh, a, a lot of non-clinical, non-healthcare settings are beginning to offer services that uh, involve a lot of invasive procedures like beauty spa, aesthetic spa, and a lot of these operators function under the delegation of a physician. And what we realize is that these areas are not subject to inspection by CPSO, but public health goes there when there is a complaint. I was wondering if the uh, if CMPA, CMPA's role extends to protecting this physician in the event that there is a breach in infection control or health and safety? Um, I'll give you the lawyer's answer. Um, it depends. <laughs> so if the physician is acting as a physician and he, is, he or she is a member of the CMPA, so to get protection, you have to be a member. Second, you have to be acting as a, as a, as a clinician. In those sorts of situations, we would generally support the physician. If he's acting as uh, an owner or a, an administrator uh, and has done, uh, you know, failed to abide by the regulations of the province, it would depend. We might, we might not. So um, our business is to help physicians in their practices and in, their, and in, in creating uh, safety. Now, we are offering, through our subsidiary, I think Margaret Hanlon-Bell is the CEO of Sages, is sitting here, offering uh, business solutions to people who are managing businesses. So CMPA, that's not what we do, but we set up a subsidiary and the uptake of our business solutions, how do you help physicians become better business people, um, we can do through the subsidiary because it's not our core business. And if you're interested, Margaret, and if, it's, uh, if you're talking about someone like yourself, for example, Margaret might be able to help you at the end of the talk. I'm hoping that helps. Um, so, so I have a, a question. So specific to the, the progress of transformation w within the healthcare system, are there, are there certain elements that you believe are missing? Yeah, I, I think as I watch with some dispassion, um, the, the trends in Alberta, in Ontario, uh, in Quebec, they're the most vocal, a bit in Nova Scotia, some in Saskatchewan recently. <clears throat> the undercurrent for all of those um, is a, a missing element of trust. Um, I'm not going to speak to the negotiations between the OMA and the government presently. I'm not going to speak to what's going on in Alberta between the government and the Alberta Medical Association. The challenges that the two uh, Sandic uh, federations in Quebec are dealing with in Quebec. But just at that level, uh, it is clear that trust is missing. And if we're ever going to get on the right track of saying we're all accountable for something in this healthcare system, then bridging the issue of trust um, is going to be required. And it's one of the areas that I think we can do at the CMPA because most people trust us, certainly most providers trust us. Um, when I said high 90s, last year was 97%. So if we can work with the governments and the medical associations, say, okay, so what, it, what is it that we're trying to build here? What is it that we're struggling with? And be uh, in some way work on project by project. It's that trust building, project by project, that's gonna lead to the transformation. I think simply saying, you know, we're going to eliminate wait times in Ontario. We're going to eliminate wait times in BC. Or we're going to do this. We're going to do that. And then hammer away at each other in the press about how bad each other is. We're not going to get anywhere. 
Um, so some way we got to start with some projects that say, here's what we can work on and stop slamming each other. Hi there. I'm not running away, I'm just thirsty. Um, thanks. My name's Brent. Uh, I'm with uh, Maximus. Um, I, I was really interested in your comments on the trust side, and you just spoke to them just a minute ago. You know, when, when I look at the health, I've been 25 years or so in the healthcare space, and, you know, I think we're all aware that there, there, are, um, there are lots of errors that happen, and, you know, I, I think the culture point as well that you spoke about is, is very important. Um, I look at the airline industry, and you, you mentioned the black box in the surgical um, room. I don't think we've necessarily created that, um, that openness around when things do go wrong. And I've heard very few occasions where we've really, as a community, talked about um, when things go wrong, what went wrong, how could we improve them, how do we make sure that the whole system works more safely and more reliably every time. And I'm wondering if you can comment, especially when you referenced all the data that you have, is there, is there a way that CMPA can, can play a role, not, not to identify people, but really trying to identify co sort of common sources of, of error and how we can bring those things out and, and, and talk about it more openly and more frequently? Yeah, I think that's a pivotal question that, that needs to be answered in this country, and it's not just going to be the CMPA doing it. It's at every level that this has to happen. And, uh, and I, my plea, which I must have made you ill saying it over and over and over again, is to work with others to make this thing happen. Um, I think there's probably four elements that are going to be required to, to do what you're suggesting, which is um, achieve the kind of, um, or, or work towards the kind of safety outcomes that airlines are, are able to do. And if you look at how airlines do it, there are, uh, there is technology. I mean, I think there is a requirement for some te technology to uh, act accurately record what it goes wrong. For example, in most operating rooms, what we're learning through the black box, when the physician records what went on, when the surgeon records what went on in the operating room, he'll record maybe one small minor hiccup and the procedure went well and there's you know, two pages of notes to support that. And he believes it because he doesn't remember all the bad things that almost went wrong. But black boxes don't lie. They tell you the near misses. They tell you, for example, one of the most interesting things we're learning in the early days is, and what we know in our data, is that the number one cause of uh, surgical error in the operating room is distraction. The surgeon gets distracted. Uh, and we've learned that in some operating rooms that we're deployed in now, uh, there are six, seven, eight people in the operating room, three of which don't need to be there. They're talking about where they're going for dinner that night. Um, we note that in some operating rooms, the door opening to the operating room is every two minutes. A door opens in the operating room. And when you look at the surgeon's eyes on the video, you can see him just look to one side, just momentarily. You can see in that operating room when the surgeon yells at the nurse, because he got the wrong instrument, at that very moment, the bleeding starts in the, in the uh, abdomen. So the technology helps us identify where the near misses are, where the bad things are, where are the issues that are actually causing the harm. That's one. Two, the data that we collect from that will provide insights. So now that we've got this information, what are we going to do with it? Well, the simple thing is you put a sign on the door saying, do not enter here unless you've got a good reason for coming in. Uh, another one is, you know, teaching people how to talk to each other nicely, like you would with your kids when they're screaming and throwing cake at each other. Um, and I, I can't overestimate, um, or I can't underestimate, uh, how important it is on the communication side, because that's second most common cause of, a, of an accident. So technology, the data, learning from it, developing services and products, which is what we're trying to do at Sages and at the CMPA, develop the program that actually tells you, okay, now we've got this, what do we do with it? And the final element, I go, I go back to the trust issue, is we are teaching people how to communicate bad results. We are teaching people um, that they need to speak um, clearly about up when something bad happens. 
do it in, a, in an appropriate way um, so that we can learn from that. Uh, that is what we're doing. All of that needs to happen, and it needs to happen in every jurisdiction, in every institution uh, in the country. Up at the top here. Good morning, Catherine Galton. I was hiding at the back. I couldn't see you, but I did give you the shout out you deserve. I heard, I heard it. Thank you so much. And a fantastic talk. Uh, I wanted to come back to the topic of AI or technology generally and absolutely agree with you. Uh, our sense of what's happening is that people just can't wait for a framework to be in place and therefore are picking these pieces up bit by bit because they see something they're already using has the potential for, great, for greater good or at least from their perception greater good. On the, the framework, which we absolutely agree we need, your sense about you know, is the best place for intervention at the healthcare organization level or from a regulatory perspective or maybe you'll say both, but, I, but I'll, I'll wait for your answer. Thank you. Um, yes. So I don't know. Um, I think what we're learning is where, where are the holes, where are the deficiencies, where are the obstacles. Um, what I'd love to do is to pull a group of you know, people who understand the business together and say, uh, what do we need to put in place uh, that we can replicate uh, 13 times across the country, rather than have each province um, sit and wrestle one at a time and come up with different frameworks that get confusing. So uh, I think, um, you know, it's, it's not going to be that difficult if smart people get in a room and say, you know, the key issues are going to be around um, what happens when something goes wrong. When the doctor takes advice from the computer that says, uh, this is a melanoma, um, or it's not a melanoma, and it's wrong. How do we deal with that? Um, how do we deal with, um, I think the most exciting opportunity for virtual health for me is in mental health. Um, although I'm a surgeon, I actually have some empathy. I mean, it, it, is, it comes out from time to time. It is deeply buried. Um, and the area that I have most empathy for is um, patients with mental health disorders. One, because they suffer so, 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 so silently and so ch in such a challenged way. And secondly, because we're horrible in Canada at dealing with it. We have no effective system to deal with mental health. So if I had to pick one area that I would love to be asked to, to work on with regulators and with government as to how we could deploy virtual health in some algorithms for people who live in remote communities that have no access. Before I was a surgeon, I was a family doctor in Timmins, Ontario. Um, I started out in that way and had no psychiatrist. The closest psychiatrist was Sudbury. Now this was in the Middle Ages, but still, I had to deal with, I was 25 years old, dealing with people who had serious mental health disorders. I didn't have a clue what I was doing. Nothing, I knew nothing. So the idea that we could use some technology to help people who have no access or poor access, um, even in downtown Toronto, I gather it's not easy to find a specialist to help you with mental health disease. So if I had to pick one area and, and pull together the team to say, is how are we going to deploy this in a way that's going to change the face of mental health in this country, I, mean, I would love for someone to ask me to sit on that committee. Uh, we have time for a few more yes. questions. Any more? With that, thank you, Dr. Hartley Stern. Thank you.